We're talking about DNA today. And for tonight's show, we'll be hearing from Professor John as he tells us a brief history about DNA. Hello everyone, thanks for having me. Sir, you can't wear the goggles in here. They told me I could wear the goggles, it's my thing. Okay, that could be dangerous. So what exactly is DNA? Well, Michael, you see, DNA is actually the molecule that contains the genetic coding of organisms. So how did people first discover DNA? Well, you see, it all started back in 1928 with the famous scientist Frederick Griffith. You see, he injected mice with disease-causing strains of pneumonia. <coughs> Through this, scientists learned that genetic information could be passed on from one bacterium to another through a process called transformation. Now we're going to jump to 1944, which is divisible by two. Now you see Oswald Avery, you see he repeated Griffith's work in an attempt to really see which of the heat killed molecules and bacteria really made the major difference in transformation. They made an extract and treated it with enzymes. And you see these enzymes, they destroy things like proteins, lipids, carbohydrates, your basic shopping list. But you see, transformation still occurred, so they repeated the experiment while removing the DNA. Now in this experiment, without the DNA, transformation did not occur. So in conclusion, we learned that the DNA is the nucleic acid that stores and transmits this genetic information from one generation to the next. And we'll be right back after these commercial messages. Not feeling like working? Does your stepson have a soccer game today? Well, you can kiss those fake coughs goodbye. Introducing the all new pneumonia in a bottle. Symptoms may include, but are not limited to, fever, chills, dehydration, fatigue, loss of appetite, clammy skin, sweating, fast breathing, shallow breathing, shortness of breath, wheezing, coughing, and or fast heart rate. Oh, and death. Drink it! Look how happy he is. He can't hardly contain it. Just call this number on your screen for toll-free information. And call now for a complimentary bottle of Stroke on the Go. Yeah, can we get a clean up on stage three? And welcome back to the show. How did you change so fast? Now, in 1952, Alfred Hershey and Martha Chase did experiments to try and confirm these findings. You see, they deduced that if they could know whether the protein coat or the DNA core of bacteriophages entered cells, they could know if genes were made of DNA or protein. Wait, you didn't know what a bacteriophage is? <laughs> well, it's pretty cool. Let me tell you, you see, a bacteriophage kind of looks like this. You see, it's a type of virus that finds and destroys bacteria, like a little bacteria-seeking missile. He also has a smiley face. Sir, you know about us. We, we told you this. They grew viruses and cultures containing radioactive isotopes of phosphorus-32 and sulfur-35. Since proteins contain almost no phosphorus, and DNA contains no sulfur, the radioactive substances could be used as markers. 
Now, if sulfur-35 was found in the bacteria, it would mean that the virus's protein had been injected into it. Now, instead, if phosphorus-32 was found, then it was the DNA that had been injected. So, in conclusion, they found that the genetic material of the bacteriophage was DNA, not protein. Now, in the 1950s, Rosalind Franklin began to study DNA using a technique called X-ray diffraction. Now, this is that aiming a powerful X-ray beam at concentrated DNA samples allowed her to record the scattering pattern of the X-rays on film. Now, she did this to try and find out the structure of DNA. While she couldn't find the exact shape, this was when scientists first learned about the DNA forming an X-shape. Now, it was an X-shaped pattern with strands of DNA twisted around each other. This shape is known as a helix. And now, during the same time, Francis Crick and James Watson built three-dimensional models of DNA using cardboard and wire. <laughs> uh, losers. Now, they did this to try and figure out the properties of DNA. Naturally, their models didn't really work. It failed terribly. But... After seeing Franklin's x-ray, they were able to successfully make a true model of DNA, the double helix, where two strands of DNA are wound around each other. That's working on a budget. I like this show. Glad you have to mention that. <laughs> now, also, Erwin Shargaff discovered that the percentages of guanine and cytosine bases are almost equal in any sample of DNA. The same thing was true for the other two nucleotides, adenine and thymine. The observation that A equals T and G equals C became known as Shargaff's rules. Although he didn't understand why every organism seemed to obey this rule, it was Watson and Crick who finally explained why Shargaff's rules even worked in the first place. You see, they found that hydrogen bonds formed between certain base pairs, adenine and thymine and guanine and cytosine. Now, these bonds formed between certain base pairs were called base pairings, and it showed that for every adenine in a double-stranded DNA molecule, there had to be exactly one thymine molecule to be its pair. And the same can be said for cytosine and guanine. So, Michael, thank you for having me. But I have to ask, what did you learn today? Guatemala? Feast your eyes on the double helix. That's three times as much as a single helix. Jerry, you're my math guy. Please. A chromosome is a thread-like structure of nucleic acids and protein found in the nucleus of most living cells. Now, you see, they carry genetic information in the form of genes. Now, chromosomes, I have 24 pairs of those. Now, a nucleosome is a structural unit of a eukaryotic chromosome consisting of a length of DNA coiled around a core of histones. Now, histones are basically a basic protein found in chromatin. Now, histones are not to be mistaken with kidney stones. Now, getting more in-depth into the structure of DNA, you can see that we start with chromosomes, which wrap up into these tight supercoils, which then, after being so tightly wound up, start to just become normal coils, which naturally just aren't a super. Now you see there's also nucleosomes, which form around here, and then you have histones, which are basically, as said before, just these tiny little spheres that are basically <laughs> proteins. Now, after all that, you can see that these things all come together and it forms the DNA double helix that you're so familiar with. Now it's time to talk about how DNA divides. Now this electron micrograph shows a double strand of human DNA. You can see, during DNA replication, the DNA molecule produces two new complementary strands following the rules of base pairing. Each strand of the double helix of DNA serves as a template for the new strand. Now, in order for DNA to work, you also need to understand RNA. Now there are three types of RNA. That is messenger RNA, ribosomal RNA, and transfer RNA. Now, messenger RNA carries copies of instructions for amino acid assembly throughout the cell. The proteins are assembled on the ribosomes. Now, these ribosomes are also made of several proteins, known as the ribosomal RNA. Lastly, through protein construction, transfer RNA sends the amino acids to the ribosomes, as specified by coded messages within the messenger RNA. Now, you may be wondering why I've been silhouetted in these last few shots. Well, the truth is, 
I'm not supposed to know this much about DNA, or more specifically, the replication and composition of it. Please, do not alert the authorities. Now, there are a couple other topics that I do feel a little bit obligated to at least touch on, and that's transcription and translation. Now, you see, during transcription, RNA polymerase binds to DNA and separates the DNA strands. Then our RNA polymerase then uses one strand of DNA as a template from which nucleotides are assembled into a strand of RNA. Now the other being translation, and during translation the cell uses information from messenger RNA to produce proteins. Now these are pretty complicated processes and we could probably have another three minutes worth of video on it, but this is already getting kind of lengthy, so let's just move on. But if you are interested in this topic, leave a comment and maybe we'll consider making more material on it, or just do some research yourself. We can't do everything for you, so please, do your own work. Now we're going to talk about genetic mutation. Hugh, we talked about this. Sorry. Mutations are changes in the DNA sequence that affect genetic information. Now, gene mutations result from the changes in a single gene. Chromosomal mutations involve changes in whole chromosomes. Mutations that affect one nucleotide are called point mutations because they occur at a single point in the DNA sequence. Some point mutations simply substitute one nucleotide for another and often result in the change of one of the amino acids in a protein. However, there are point mutations that involve the insertion or deletion of a whole nucleotide. Because genetic code is read in groups of three called codons, if a nucleotide is added or taken away, it shifts the grouping of every codon. This is known as a frame shift mutation. Aside from the gene mutations, there are then the chromosomal mutations. These mutations change the location of genes, or even the number of copies of some genes. There is deletion, the loss of all or a part of a chromosome, duplication, a segment is repeated, or inversion orientated in the reverse of the usual direction. Then there's also another one called translocation, where part of one chromosome breaks off and attaches to another non-homologous chromosome. Most translocations occur in pairs. This program has been brought to you by pneumonia in a bottle, and by stroke on the go, and by contributions to your local PBS station, and by viewers like you. Thank you.